Okay. Um, so yeah, this is our first time in the Bay Area, so it's nice to meet you all, um, and thanks for coming on you know, not so much notice. So I'll start by just giving a quick introduction of us and uh, you know some of the things that we're doing uh, before I start with the sort of main content of the talk, which is about uh, this open source library that uh, we developed, Spacey, uh, for natural language processing. So the other things that uh, we develop as well at Explosion AI uh, is uh, a machine learning library behind Spacey, Think, uh, which allows us to avoid depending on other libraries and kind of keep control of everything and make sure that everything's easy to install. Uh, we also have an annotation tool that we uh, develop alongside Spacey, Prodigy, which is what Innes will be talking about. Uh, and we're also preparing a data store of other pre-trained models that, uh, for more specific languages and use cases and things that people will be able to use uh, that basically will extend the capabilities of uh, the software for more specific use cases. So to give you a quick introduction to uh, uh, Innes and I, which is basically all of Explosion AI, uh, so I've been working on natural language processing for pretty much my whole career. Uh, I started doing this after doing a PhD in uh, computer science. I started off in linguistics and then kind of moved across to com computational linguistics. Uh, and then around 2014, I saw that these technologies were getting increasingly viable. And I was also at the point in my career where I was supposed to start writing grant proposals, which didn't really agree with me. So I decided to leave and I saw that there was a gap in the capabilities available for something that actually translated the research systems to something that was more sort of practically focused. Uh, and then, you know, soon after I moved to Berlin to do this, I uh, met Innes and uh, we've been working together since on these things. And I think, you know, we kind of have a nice complementarity of things. And uh, she uh, has is the lead developer of our annotation tool Prodigy and has also been working on uh, Spacey pretty much since the first release. Okay, so I included this slide, which we normally actually give this when we talk to companies specifically, but I think that it's a good thing to include to give you a bit of, um, you know, this is what we tell people about what we do and how we make money and uh, how the company works. And I think that this is a very valid question that people would have about an open source library. It's like, well, why are you doing this? And, you know, how does it fit into the rest of your uh, projects and plans? Uh, so the explain it like I'm five version, which I guess is also the explain it like I'm senior management version, is we give an analogy. It's kind of like a boutique kitchen. So uh, the free recipes we publish online, you can see, is kind of like the open source software. Uh, so that's spacey, think, etc. Uh, at the start of the company, especially, we were doing consulting, which uh, I'm happy to say we've been able to wind down over the last uh, six months and focus on our products. Uh, and then we also uh, focus on a line of kitchen gadgets, which is uh, things like Prodigy. These are these downloadable tools to use alongside the open source software. And soon we'll have this sort of premium ingredients, which are the pre-trained models. Uh, so the thing that we don't do here is enterprise support, which I guess is probably the most common way that people, uh, you know, fund open source software or imagine that they'll fund open source software with um, a business model. And we really don't like this because we want our software to be as easy to use as possible and as transparent as possible and the documentation to be good. So I think it's kind of weird to have this thing where you have explicitly a plan that we're going to make our free stuff as good as possible and then we're going to have this service that we hope nobody, we hope people pay us lots of money for, but we hope nobody uses. And that's kind of weird, right? It's kind of weird to have a company that, you know, you hope that your paid offering is really poor value to people. And so we, we don't think that that's a good way to do it. And so instead we have uh, the downloadable tools, I think is a good way to, uh, you know, we have something which works alongside Spacey and I think is useful to uh, people who use Spacey as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, onto the sort of main content of the talk and, uh, you know, the bit that I'll be talking about. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, syntactic parser within Spacey, the uh, natural language processing library that we use. And uh, so before doing, so this is kind of what it looks like uh, as, you know, sort of visualized as an output. So it's this sort of tree-based structure that uh, gives you the uh, this these syntactic relationships between words. So uh, the way that you should read this here is that um, uh, the arrow pointing from this word to this word means that apple is a child of uh, looking in the tree. And it's a child with this relationship in such. In other words, apple is the subject of looking. Uh, and is is an auxiliary verb uh, attached to looking. And then um, at is a prepositional phrase attached to looking. So these sorts of relationships tell you about the syntactic structure of the sentence and basically help you get at the who did what to whom sort of relationships in the sentence and also to extract phrases and things. 
So for instance, here, um, to make the thing more easy to read, we've merged uh, UK startup, which is, you know, a sort of basic noun phrase into one uh, unit. Uh, and you can find these sorts of phrases more easily from uh, given the syntactic structure. And uh, just above here, we've got an example of, you know, what the code looks like to actually get the syntactic structure or navigate the tree. Uh, in Spacey, you just uh, get this NLP object after loading the models, and you just use that as a function that you feed text. Um, or pipe text through if you've got a sequence of texts. Uh, and uh, given that, you get a document object, uh, which you can just use as an iterable, and uh, from the tokens you get attributes that you can use to navigate the tree. Uh, so for instance here, the uh, dependency relationship is just a dot .dep. Um, uh, by default, that's an integer key, in integer ID, because everything's kind of coded to an integer for uh, easy uh, and efficient processing, but then you can get the, the text value with an underscore as well. And then you can navigate up the tree with dot head, and then you can look at the left and right children of the tree as well. So we try to have a rich API that makes it easy to use the, these dependency relationships. Uh, you know, so that it just getting dependency passes, you know, obviously just the first step. You want to actually use it in some way, and that's why we have this API to uh, make that easy. So the question that always comes up with this, and it's, I think this is a very interesting thing for the field in general, um, is, you know, what's the point of parsing? Like, what, what is this actually good for in terms of applications? So, uh, Joav Goldberg is a very uh, prominent parsing researcher, and he's, you know, this is kind of the stuff that he's studied for most of his career, and uh, he's, you know, one of the more well-known uh, parsing people. And so it's interesting to see him uh, and other people reflect on this and say that he finds it fascinating that even though we have so many best papers in NLP and uh, so it's kind of a high prestige thing to study parsing. Uh, but uh, it seems like syntax is hardly used in practice in uh, you know, most of these applications. So the, the question is, you know, why is this? Um, is it just that because parsing is based on trees and structured predictions kind of fun to study and there's all, all these deep algorithmic questions, is it just kind of this catnip to researchers? Uh, and is it, um, does it have this kind of over prominence in the field? Or is it uh, that um, you know, there is something deeper about this and uh, we should really be continue studying this. Well, I think that this is, there's kind of, a, I can go either way on this. And so this slide shows you that, you know, the case for parsing and then I'll, you know, kind of have a counterpoint in a second. So the, I think that the most important case for parsing is that there's a sort of deep truth to the fact that sentences are tree structured. That's, they just are, right? Um, uh, language, uh, syntactic, uh, structure of sentences is recursive, and that means that you can have arbitrarily long gaps between two words which are related. So, uh, for instance, if you have um, a, a relationship between, say, a, a subject and a verb, like syntax is, um, whether the uh, the subject of that uh, verb is uh, plural or uh, singular is going to change the form of the verb. And that dependency between them can be arbitrarily long because you can have this nested structure. Um, but it will never but it can't be arbitrarily long in tree space because, um, you know, there's only, if you, the relationship between them will always be the, the subject and the verb, like sort of next to each other in the tree. Um, so you can see how in so, for some of these things, it should be sort of more efficient to think about it or model it as a tree. Uh, and the tree should tell you things that uh, you otherwise would have to infer from an enormous amount of data. Uh, it, it should be more efficient in this way. So we can say, okay, you know, in theory, it sh this should be important. Um, and it should be something that we study based on this knowledge about how sentences are structured. Um, so then the sort of counterpoint to this is, all right, so sentences are tree structured, and that, that's a truth about sentences. But it's also true that they're written and read in order. Um, so, you know, if you read a sentence, you do read it from left to right, um, well, in English anyway, or like basically from start to finish, or you hear a sentence from start to finish. And this really puts a sort of bounding on the linear complexity that you will em empirically see, right? Because when somebody wrote this sentence, yes, they could have an arbitrarily long dependency, but they expect that, you know, that would mean that their audience listening to it will have to wait arbitrarily long between, you know, some word and the thing that it attaches to. And that's kind of not very nice, right? So empirically, it's um, not very surprising to see that most dependencies are in fact short. Um, and, you know, there's a, a lot of arguments that the options that are kind of provided to grammars are sort of arranged so that uh, you're able to keep your dependencies short. Like that's sort of, sort of some of the reasons you have options for how to move things around in sentences to make nice reading orders, because, you know, you want short dependencies. So this means that if most dependencies are short, then 
processing text as, say, chunks of words of one or two at a time kind of gives you a pretty similar view. Um, most of the time you don't get something that's so dramatically different if you're able if you look at a tree instead of looking at chunks of three or four word sentences so you know this is kind of a counterpoint that says you know maybe even though the sentences are in fact tree structured maybe it's not that crucially useful so i think that the part that makes this you know particularly rewarding to look at uh, syntax or particularly useful to provide syntactic structures in a, a library like spacey is that they're application independent so there's the syntactic structure of the sentence doesn't depend on what you hope to do with the sentence or how you hope to process it. And that's something that's quite different from other labels or other information that we can attach to the sentence. If you're doing something like a sentiment analysis, there's no truth about the sentence of a, sentiment of a sentence that's independent of what you're hoping to process. Like, that's not a thing that's in the text itself. It's, you know, um, a lens that you want to take on it based on how you want to process it. So, you know, there's a whether you consider some review to be positive or negative depends on your application. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not necessarily in the text itself because, you know, what counts as positive or negative? What's the labeling scheme? What's the rating scheme? Um, or, you know, exactly what are they talking about? Well, that the taxonomy that you have will depend on what you're hoping to process with. Um, those things aren't in the language, but, this, but uh, details about the syntactic structure are in the language. They're things which are, you know, just part of the structure of the code. Um, and that means that we can provide these things, sort of learn it once and give it to many people. And I think that that's very valuable and useful and different from other types of annotations that we could calculate and attach. And that's why Spacey provides pre-trained models for syntax, but doesn't provide pre-trained models for something like sentiment, because we know how to give you a syntactic analysis that's, you know, as useful as it may be, or maybe not, uh, depending on you know, whether that actually solves your problems. But at least it's sort of true and generalizable. Um, whereas we don't know how to give you, we don't know what categorization scheme you want to classify your text in. So we can't give you a pre-trained model that does that because that's your own problem. Um, so we try to, you know, basically give you these things which are annotation layers, which do generalize in this way. And that means that there has to be a sort of linguistic truth to them. And that means that looking at things like the semantic roles or sentence structure or um, sentence divisions are things that we can do. And that's why we, you know, are interested in this. So the other thing about uh, uh, syntactic structures and, you know, whether they're useful or not is that in English, not using syntax is pretty powerful because uh, English orth orthography happens to cut things up into pretty convenient units. Um, they're not optimal units, but they're still, like, pretty nice um, in a way that doesn't really hold true across a lot of other languages. So in the bottom right here, we have uh, Japanese, which... Uh, you know, usually isn't segmented into words. Like you can't just cut um, uh, that up trivially with white space and get something that you can feed into a search engine or get something that you can feed forward into a topic model. You have to do some extra work. And the extra work that you do there really should consider syntactic structure. Um, you can use a technology that only makes linear decisions, but the you know, truth about what counts as a word or not is very entangled with the syntactic structure, and so there's real value in doing it jointly with syntactic parsing. Um, for other languages, you have kind of the opposite problem. Um, so uh, we have here um, a German word, and uh, this you know, is the German word for income tax return. Now, um, whether or not you want that to be uh, sort of one unit will depend on what you're looking for. For many applications, actually, the English phrase is too short, um, and the domain object, the thing that you want to be you know, looking for and having a single node in your knowledge graph for would actually be income tax return. That's pretty awesome. Um, but in other applications, maybe you just want to look for tax. And so uh, in those cases, the German word will be too large and your data will be too sparse. So uh, there's, you know, there's sort of different um, aspects of this. Um, in the bottom left here, we have um, uh, an example of um, Hebrew. And uh, like Arabic and um, other, um, a couple of other languages like this, uh, there's no vowels in the text, and the words tend to be kind of have all sorts of attachments to them that are difficult to segment off. Um, so there again, you have difficult like segmentation problems that are all tangled up with the syntactic processing. Okay, so um, uh, so going forward to sort of an example of what um, uh, what we can do if we you know recognize non white space looking words uh, and uh, feed them into um, some of the other uh, processing um, stuff that we have. So uh, uh, this is a demo that we prepared a couple of years ago for um, uh, an approach that we call, um, that 
is termed sense to vec. So all this is is basically processing text um, using uh, natural language processing tools, in this case specifically Spacey, in order to recognize these uh, uh, concepts that are longer than one word. So specifically here we um, looked for base noun phrases uh, and also named entities, and we just merged those into one token before f uh, feeding the text forward into um, a, a word to vec implementation, which gives you sort of these semantic relationships. And this uh, this lets you search um, for and find uh, similarities between uh, phrases which are much longer than one word. And in, as soon as you do this, you find ah the the things which I'm searching for are much more specific in meaning. I'm not you know looking for you know one meaning of learning or one meaning of processing, which doesn't tend to be so useful or interesting. Instead, I'm looking you can find things related to natural language processing, and then you see ah machine learning, computer vision, etc. These are you know real results that came out of the thing. Uh, uh, as soon as you did this um, uh, division. And so um, uh, we can do this for other languages as well. So if we were doing, if we were, were hoping to use word to vec for a language like Chinese, you really want to be processing it into words before you do that. Or if you're going to do this for a language like Finnish, you really want to uh, cut off the morphological suffixes before you uh, do this. Okay. So. Um, uh, incidentally, uh, Innes has cleaned up the uh, sense to vec recently, so um, you can actually use this as a handy component within Spacey. Uh, so you can load up a, um, a standard model and then uh, add a component that gives you these sense to vec sensors. So you can just say, all right, um, uh, the token for three would be natural language processing because it would do the merging for you. And then you can also look up the similarity. So it's now much easier to actually use the uh, the pre-trained model and use that approach uh, within Spacey. Um, uh, incidentally, we have this um, concept of an extension attribute in Spacey so that you can kind of attach your own uh, uh, things to the tokens so that you can, you know, basically uh, attach your own little markups or um, uh, processing things. So the this underscore object is a um, kind of a free space that you can attach attributes to, um, which ends up being quite convenient. Uh, it's a lot more convenient than you know trying to subclass something or something. Okay, so um, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll give you a little bit of a pretty brief uh, overview of the parsing algorithm, uh, and then uh, explain how we're going to how we're modifying the parsing algorithm to uh, work with languages other than English, uh, so that we can basically broaden out the support of Spacey to these other languages. So uh, w what we see here is a um, a completed parse, and I'm going to sort of uh, talk you through the steps um, that the or the decision points that the parser is going to uh, make to derive this structure. Um, and the so the kind of key uh, thing to keep in mind, or the, the key um, uh, like aspect of the solution, is that it's going to read the sentence from left to right and maintain some state, and uh, then it's going to have a sort of fixed inventory of actions that it has to choose between. Uh, to manipulate the, the current parse state to build up the arcs. And uh, this type of approach, which is called transition-based parsing, I, I find deeply satisfying because uh, it um, it's linear in time because you uh, only make so many decisions per word. Uh, and I do think that it makes a lot of sense to uh, take algorithms which process language incrementally. I think that that's sort of deeply satisfying and um, sort of correct in a way that a lot of other approaches to parsing aren't. And it's also a very flexible approach. So we can do joint modeling and uh, have it output all sorts of other structures as well as the um, uh, the parse tree. And that's actually what we're going to do. So already in Spacey, we've been, we have uh, joint prediction of the sentence boundaries in the parse tree. And uh, what we're going to do is extend this so that it does joint prediction of um, word boundaries as well. OK, so here's how the sort of decision process of, um, decide, of building the tree works. So we start off with um, in an initial state, and so um, for sort of ease of notation or ease of readability, um, we're notating the sort of first word of the buffer, um, as so the first word that's kind of being focused on um, as uh, this kind of beam of highlighting, uh, and then the other element of the um, the state is a stack, and so when uh, as the first action that we do, we have an action that. Uh, can advance the buffer one and put the word that was previously at the start of the buffer onto the stack. So here's what that's, that shift move is going to look like. Um, so here um, we have uh, Google on the stack, which we write up here, uh, and the first word of the buffer is read on. Uh, and so then uh, another action that we can take is to form a dependency arc between uh, the word that's on top of the stack and the first word of the buffer. 
So in this case, we want to attach um, uh, Google as a child of reader. So we have an action that does that. And uh, because we're building a tree, when we um, make an arc to Google, uh, we know that we can pop it from the stack because it uh, the because it's a tree, it only can have one uh, head. It can only have sort of one attachment point. It's not a you know uh, it's not a different type of graph. And so that means that we can kind of you know do that and keep moving forward. So here's what that looks like. We add an arc and pop Google from the stack. Uh, so now we make the next move. Um, uh, clearly, we've got no words on the stack, so we should put reader on the stack so that we can continue. Um, now we're at was, um, and now we want to decide whether we should make an arc directly between was and reader. In this case, no, we want to attach was to cancelled. So we're going to move was onto the stack and move forward onto cancelled. So then here we do want this arc um, uh, between cancelled and was. Um, so we do another left arc. And so we basically continue here. So uh, we so sort of stepping back a bit and thinking about this, we've got a fixed inventory of actions. And uh, at, and as long as we can predict the right sequence of those actions, we can derive the correct parse. So that's how the machine learning model is going to work here. Uh, the machine learning model is going to be a classifier that predicts, given some state, uh, what to do next. Uh, and uh, you can sort of imagine that we can have other actions instead if we wanted to um, predict other aspects of the structure. So in the case of Spacey, we have an action that inserts a sentence boundary. Um, so it just says, all right, given the words that are currently on the stack, you have to make actions that can uh, clear the stack, but you're not allowed to um, push the next token until your stack is clear. And that means that, you know, there's going to be a sentence boundary there. Um, if we, uh, and, you know, we could have other actions as well. There, there's been uh, work to uh, jointly predict part of speech tags at the same time as you're parsing, or um, you can do semantics at the same time as you do syntax. And so you can code up all sorts of structures into this, and you're going to read the sentence left to right, and you're going to output some, you know, meaning structure attached to it. And, you know, as I said, I find this like a satisfying way to, uh, you know, do natural language understanding, because it does involve like, you know, reading the sentence and adding an interpretation incrementally. Okay, so that's what, you know, this looks like as we proceed through. Um, so, all right, so how are we going to do this, you know, splitting up of, or merging of um, uh, other things? Well, it's actually not that complicated given this transition-based framework. So um, already you can kind of see that in order to merge tokens, all we really have to do is, you know, we've got those tokens and we can, if we wanted Google Reader to be one token, we just have to have some special dependency label which we are going to have in the tree. And so, you know, I'll use the, the label subtoken, and then uh, all we have to do is say, all right, at the end of parsing, we're going to uh, consider that as one token. So um, the step from, you know, going through something like this and uh, labeling a language like Chinese is actually super simple. We just have to prepare, prepare the training data so that the tokens are individual characters. Uh, and uh, then we can say, all right, things which should be one word get... Um, uh, should have this sort of structure with this label, and then uh, if they if the parser decides that those things are attached together, then at the end of it you just merge them up. Um, the splitting tokens is more complicated because you have to have you know some universe of actions that manipulates the strings. So I'm still sort of working on the implementation of this in a way that isn't uh, that's sort of clean and tidy, but I actually think that this will be useful for a lot of English text as well because. Uh, if you have English text that's sort of misspelled, a lot of the time things which should be two tokens get merged into one. So it's is a um, particularly common and, and frustrating one of this because you know the verb um, is uh, should be its own token. But if you have it's as its, which is also a common word in English, um, you you know need to figure out that you have to have two parser actions, two parser states for that. And in general, you could have a statistical model that reads the sentence beforehand. But that statistical model that, you know, is going to read the sentence and process it is going to end up do, taking on work and doing jobs of figuring out the syntactic structure of the sentence in order to make those decisions. And that's why I think doing these things jointly is kind of satisfying because um, instead of learning the same that information in one level of representation and throwing it away um, only to build up the same information in the next, like, pass of the pipeline, uh, you can do it all at once. And so I think that, you know, the joint incremental approaches, I think, are very satisfying and good. Okay, so where are we at the moment? Um, so uh, I've implemented the learning to merge, um, uh, you know, um, side of things, which uh, involves uh, 
uh, figuring out better alignments between the, the gold standard tokenization and the output of the uh, tokenizer. And uh, that's allowed me to complete the experiments for um, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, uh, and Japanese of the um, Conference in Natural Language Learning uh, 2017 benchmark, which was a sort of bake-off of these parsing models, which was uh, conducted last year. Now, in uh, in that benchmark, the team from Stanford did um, uh, extremely well compared to everybody else in the field. They were, you know, some two or three percentage points uh, better. Um, and uh, so at the moment, we're ranking kind of at the top of what was the second place pack. So in most of the languages were coming sort of underneath the Stanford system, uh, but um, uh, with uh, significantly better efficiency and with sort of this end-to-end -end process. And in particular, we're doing better than... Uh, Stanford on these languages like Chinese, Vietnamese, and Japanese, because the Stanford system did have this disadvantage of using the sort of pre-processed text. They didn't do the whole task. They wanted to just use the the uh, provided pre-processed uh, uh, text so that they could focus on the parsing algorithm. And that meant that they did have this error propagation problem. If the inputs are incorrect because the pre-processed segmenter is incorrect, then they uh, uh, have a, a big disadvantage on these languages. So. Um, satisfyingly, we um, the sort of doing all the, all at once and entangling all of these representations um, it does have this advantage, and we're seeing that in uh, the results that we have for um, those languages. And the other thing that's satisfying is that this joint modeling approach of deciding the segmentation at the same time as deciding the the parse structure is consistently better than the pipeline approach in our experiments. So um, by you know basically. Um, we're getting a sort of one to three percent improvement from this, which is about the same size as we're getting from using the neural network model instead of the linear model. So I've found this, you know, also quite satisfying that, you know, the sort of conceptually neat solution is also working well in practice. Okay, so where, where does this go, and what do we hope to deliver from this? Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yes, that would probably be good. Um, uh, how am I for time? Um, Ah, okay. Well, this is the last slide, so you know, wrapping up. Um, uh, okay, so you know, what we want to do is we want to um, deliver a sort of workflow or user experience where it's very easy to start with these pre-trained models for um, the different languages and ap and ap broad application areas, and we want to make sure that they have the same representation across languages. So you get the same parse uh, uh, parse scheme, which you know the. Uh, folks have been working hard on and basically now have a pretty satisfying solution from the universal dependencies. And so if you're processing text from different languages, it should be easy to find, say, subject-verb relationships or direct-object relationships. And that should work across, you know, basically any language so that you can use these parse trees and basically have a level of abstraction from the um, which language the text is in. Um, uh, and then uh, given this, you should be able to do pretty powerful rule-based matching from uh, the parse tree and other annotations that are provided. Um, so it should be pretty easy to find information, uh, uh, even without knowing much about the language and reuse rules across language. Um, and uh, then uh, if the model, uh, if the syntactic model and named entity models that we provide aren't accurate enough, um, the library should support easy updating of those, including learning new vocabulary items without you taking particular effort from this. Um, and overall, we sort of want to emphasize a, a workflow of rapid iteration and data annotation. Um, so the concept of this is that, you know, we should be able to provide things which give a sort of broad-based um, understanding of language, but uh, that still ends up with uh, a need for the uh, knowledge specific to your domain and the training data and evaluation data specific to your problems. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that it's, you know, easy to connect the two up and uh, go the extra start from a basic understanding of language and move forward to uh, building the specific applications, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, now Ines will be talking about that aspect of the, you know, sort of intended package. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so the... Oh, yes, certainly. Um, uh, so the lead past what the sort of overall difference or main most important difference between Spacey's parsing algorithm and Stanford's parsing algorithm. So amongst other things, the sort of most fundamental difference is that Stanford, uh, Stanford's system uh, is a graph-based parser. So this is ON, um, like 
uh, on squared or maybe on cubed um, in length of the sentence. So uh, it's you're unable to use this type of parsing algorithm for joint segmentation and parsing. Uh, you have to have a pre-segmented text, which is why it's uh, you know has this disadvantage on languages uh, which are more difficult or text which is more difficult to segment into sentences. So in space, we want to make sure that we you know basically are you know, only use linear time algorithms, and that's why uh, we only take this transition-based approach. Um, uh, other reasons, sort of, why they they get such a good result. Other people have done graph-based um, models, and they're not nearly as accurate. So, I you know, I hope to meet the Stanford team in the next couple of days, and you know, shake out the details of why the system is so accurate. Because actually, it is quite surprising. I've read their papers several times, and I can't get the sort of one key insight that you know means that their system performs so well. It's it's interesting. Uh, something that could replace the need for syntax and parsing or the reverse, or how do you feel about that? Um, so I think that right, yes, certainly, <laughs> yes. Um, so the uh, the question, which is a, a very good one, that uh, many people have been thinking about, is um, to what extent can end to end uh, systems which you know maybe learn things about syntax but learn them latently and don't have an explicit syntactic representation internally uh, replace the need for this type of um, syntactic processing so I would say that um, for any application where there's sufficient text um, currently the best uh, approach sort of state-of-the-art approach doesn't use a parser um, and actually this includes translation and other things where you would you know kind of expect that having an explicit syntactic layer would help if there's enough text it seems that going straight to the end-to-end -to -end representation tends to be better however that does involve having a lot of text and for most applications um, creating that much training data especially initially when you're prototyping um, tends not to be such a viable solution so um, the way that I see it is that the parsing uh, stuff is a great scaffolding um, and it's a very practical thing to have in your toolbox, um, especially when you're trying to figure out how to model the problem. So, because otherwise you end up in this chicken and egg situation of, well, we need lots of data to make our model work well, um, and otherwise it just doesn't really get off the ground. But then how do we even know that we're collecting the right data for the right model until we have that data collected and we can see the accuracy? So if you can take sort of smaller steps um, using these sorts of rule-based scaffolding and bootstrapping approaches, I think you have a much more powerful and practical uh, set of tools. And then finally, once you have a, a system that you know you want to eke out every percent, you know, maybe you end up collecting enough data that you don't need a parser in your solution explicitly. So Dalip has uh, pointed to a paper that you know recently showed that it uh, you know by LSTM models don't necessarily learn long range dependencies. I think that that's you know probably true, but you know if, as somebody who's worked on parsing for a lot of my career, I try to remind myself not to cherry pick results. And uh, you know even if I do find a paper that shows that parsing works on something, well the overall trend is that um, you know by LSTM models which don't use parsing um, work well. And the fact is that long range dependencies are kind of rare. So it's, you know, uh, it's, it, you know, that that's basically why it's important to be asking, well, you know, what are these things good for and not say, ah, oh, everything should be u using parsing because it's, you know, it's true that not everything should. Um, uh, so the question is, uh, you know, if we look at other uh, aspects of language variation instead of just, you know, say the segmentation and things, um, how does the incremental model perform? So specifically, how does it perform in free word order languages, uh, uh, perhaps ones with, you know, cross long ra longer range or crossing dependencies? So Stanford actually, their their paper had excellent analysis about a lot of these questions, and so they um, they showed that. Um, their model, which is much less sensitive to whether the trees are projective, um, they do do relatively well in those languages. Um, so for um, uh, for our preliminary results, um, uh, we do fine on German um, and pretty well on Russian. Um, uh, we still suck at Finnish, um, and uh, I think there's a bug in Korean. Um, you know, it's at like 50%. Um, so... Uh, it's a mixed bag, but I would say that 
there's some problems to solve about the projectivity. Um, the way that I'm doing this is a little bit crude at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, so in general, there is a disadvantage that we take from the incremental approach in this. Um, and uh, there's a lot of clever solutions that I'm looking into for this. Uh, so yeah. Um, so there's an uh, there's a pretty good extension package for uh, co-reference resolution that um, has taken some of the pressure off us to support it internally. Um, we do think that co-reference resolution is something that does belong in the library because it's something that is does have that property of being a language internal thing. I think that there's a truth about whether that he or she belongs to that noun that doesn't depend on the application. It's just a true fact about that sentence. So we're very interested in being able to give you that piece of annotation. I don't. I wouldn't quite say the same thing about the sentiment. Um, I don't quite know. I, don't, I haven't been convinced by any schema of sentiment that um, is sufficiently independent of what you're trying to do that we could provide it. Instead, what we do provide you is a text categorization library. And the text categorization model that we have is, you know, only one of many that you might build. And it's not best for every application. Um, but it does do pretty well for short text. Um, uh, and uh, I think that, you know, on many sentiment benchmarks, it performs quite well. Um, it's a lot slower than some other sentiment um, ways that you could do sentiment. Um, so it depends on what you, what type of text you're trying to process and, you know, that sort of thing. Well, oh, yes. So the, right. So um, explicitly the, the co-reference resolution package that you should use is called neural co-ref. Um, so neural co-ref. Yeah. Yeah, and it's built on it's built on PyTorch. It's overall pretty good. You can train it yourself. Like, yeah, well, Py, like PyTorch is the machine learning layer, but yes, it's built on Space. So yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so using the so for German, um, I think it's pretty easy. Like, uh, I've been using the uh, word vectors trained by fast text and. Uh, you know, you can basically just plug that in. So uh, there's sort of one command to convert that into a spacey vocab object and, you know, load it up. Uh, we're trying to provide pre-trained models which don't depend on uh, pre-trained word vectors so that you can bring your own because otherwise there's kind of this conflict of, you know, we've the model's been trained to expect some word vectors and then if you sub your own in, it's going to get different input representations. Um, so, but yeah, uh, training or bringing your own uh, vectors is designed to be pretty easy and if it's not I apologize if there's bugs and we'll try to fix them so um, so the question is after you know parsing and interpreting uh, do we have an interlingua representation that can then be used to generate another language um, the answer is probably not I mean I don't have we don't have generation capabilities in spacey um, people have worked on this uh, sort of thing, but um, in general, ex having an explicit interlingua uh, tends to perform less well than um, more brute force statistical approaches to syntax. And the, I think the reason does sort of make sense that, you know, the languages are pretty different in the way that they phrase things and the way that they model the world in lots of ways. And so getting a, a translation that's remotely idiomatic out of that sort of interlingua representation is pretty tough. So... And then there's another argument that you're solving a, a sub-problem uh, uh, that's harder than the th than the direct translation approach, which I'm not sure whether I buy that argument or not, but it's a common one that people use. So. Okay, so um, uh, should we move forward to the next talk? So. So yeah, we've we started out by hearing a lot about the more theoretical side of things, and I'm actually going to talk about how we collect and build training data for all these great models we can now build. And um, the nice thing about machine learning is that, well, we can now train a system by just showing in examples of what we want, and that's great. But the problem is, of course, we need those examples. And even if you're like, oh, I got this all figured out, I'm using this amazing unsupervised method that where my system just infers um, the categories from the data, and I never need to label any data. That's pretty nice, but you still need some way of evaluating your system. So we pretty much always need some form of annotations. And now the question is, well, why 
why do we even care about this? Why do we care about whether this is efficient, um, whether this works or not? Um, the thing is, the, or, the big problem is that we actually, with many things in data science and machine learning, we need to try out things before we know whether they work. Or we often don't know whether an idea is going to work before we try it. So we need to expect to do um, annotation lots of times and start off from scratch, um, start all over again if we got if we fucked up our label scheme, um, try something else. So we, we need to do this lots of times, so it needs to work. And um, similarly, um, especially, you know, if you're working in a company, in a team, um, where you really, um, you know, want to use your model to find something out, um, ideally the person building the model should be involved in that process. And also, you know, we always say good annotation teams are small. A lot of people don't understand this. There's a lot of, I don't know, movement towards, uh, oh, let's crowdsource this, get like hundreds of volunteers. And we always have to remind, especially companies that, um, well, look at the big corpora that we use to train models. Like those, the good ones were produced by very few people. And there, there's a reason for that. It like does not, the, more people doesn't always mean better results, actually quite the opposite. So, um, you know, how, how great would it be if actually the developer of the model could be involved in labeling the data? Um, and of course, we also have the problem of this, the, or the specialist knowledge, especially in, um, um, you know, in industries where this matters, you might want to have a medical professional give some feedback um, on the labels or actually really label your data or maybe a finance expert. Um, and yeah, those people usually have limited time. If you get an hour of their time, you want to use it more efficiently and you don't want to um, bore them to death or actually find the one person who has nothing else to do because they're probably, their knowledge is probably not as valuable as um, yeah, other, people, other experts' knowledge. Um, and yeah, and another big problem since you know, you want humans is that humans are actually, humans kind of suck. Like we really, we're not that <laughs> efficient <laughs> at a lot of a lot of things. So for example, like we really have problems performing boring, unstructured tasks, especially things that require multiple steps and multiple things we need to get right. We can't remember stuff. Um, we, um, yeah, we really, we're bad at consistency and getting stuff right. So um, yeah, fortunately, computers are really good at that stuff. And in fact, it's probably also, yeah, the main reason we built computers. Um, so there's really no need to waste the human's time by making them do stuff that they're going to do badly anyways. And instead, we want our annotation tooling to be as autom like automated as possible. Or we want to, in general, we want to automate as much as possible and really have the human focus on the stuff that the human is good at and we really need that input. And that's usually context ambiguity, like stuff like we can look at a sentence and most of us will be able to understand the figure of, of speech immediately without thinking twice about it. That's the stuff that's really, really hard um, for a computer. Also, you know, put differently, yeah, humans are good at precision, computers are good at recall. So the thing is, yeah, what I'm saying here, it sounds a bit like uh, floss and eat your veggies. Um, yeah, we've probably all have had some experience with labeling data and um, normally, um, yeah, we also gave this talk to a crowd of um, like yeah, more data science uh, focused um, prof industry professionals, and actually, you, oh, yeah, you'd be surprised how how many companies we talk to. Also, very large companies, very te actually technologically sophisticated companies that mostly use Excel spreadsheets for everything, and it's not inherently bad, but they are very obvious problems with Excel spreadsheets, and it, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. So. Once people figure this out and realize that maybe they could do something better, or it's just terrible, like we don't want to do this, the next move is normally let's move this all out to Mechanical Turk um, or some other crowdsourced platform. And yeah, Mechanical Turk, the um, Amazon cloud of human labor. Um, and so, yeah, people do that. And often then I'm also surprised that their results are not very good. And um, the problem is, yeah, okay, so you have some, some guy do it for $5 an hour, um, get the data back, train your model, doesn't work. And actually, it's, it's, it's very difficult to then retroactively find out what the problem was. Maybe your label scheme was bad, maybe um, your idea was bad, maybe the data was bad, maybe you didn't write your annotation manual properly, um, maybe, actually, yeah, another, another nice thing, maybe you pay too much, because, you know, that if you pay too much on Mechanical Turk, you uh, track all the bad actors, so you kind of have to stick to the, like, half of, ha <laughs> half um, minimum wage. So that could have been a problem. Um, your maybe your model was bad, your training code was bad. It's very, very difficult 
um, to find that out. And also you realize that, well, it's, it's not really just a cheap click work. Like you, um, you know, you need to do a bit more. So then, yeah, what most people conclude from this is, ooh, um, fuck this labeling in general. I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, let's just find, um, some unsupervised method and like not bother with this. And the, that's actually, yeah, also a conversation I had recently where uh, we talked to a larger media company and they've done exactly that. And now they have a few hundred clusters. And it's really great. They have really great clusters. But um, now their problem is that they, they have no idea what these clusters are. So they now need to label their clusters. And now they're kind of back in the beginning. And um, I think what we see from this is that the label data itself, it's the fact that we need label data, that's an opportunity. That is not the problem. The problem is how we do it. And um, yeah, so the, and there are a few, like we've been thinking about this a lot, and there, there are at least, um, yeah, from our point of view, there are a lot of things we could do um, better. So um, one of the things really to work against this problem that we have caused by us being human is that we, should we need to break down these very, very complex um, things we're asking the humans into um, smaller, simpler questions. And ideally, these should be binary decisions. So we can have a much better annotation speed because we can move through the things faster and we can also measure the reliability um, much easier than if we ask people open questions because we can actually say okay do our annotators agree do they not agree because that's in the end very important to find out whether we've collected data the right way and the binary thing itself it sounds very it sounds a bit radical but actually if you think about it most or pretty much any task can be bro broken down into a sequence of binary decisions, like yes or no it, decisions. It might mean that we have to accept that, okay, and if we're annotating a sentence or entities, we won't actually end up with a gold standard, uh, with gold standard data for this sentence. We might actually end up with only partially annotated data and have to deal with that. But, as a, but still, um, we're actually able to use our human's time more efficiently, which um, is often much more important. So. Um, a, lot of ex that, a lot of the examples I'm going to show you now are uh, from are using our annotation tool Prodigy, which um, yeah we started building as an internal tool, but we very very quickly realized that okay this is really something pretty much every company we talk to, most users we talk to, this was always something that kept coming up. So we thought okay what what if we really combine um, all these ideas we already have and how to train a model, actually use the technology we're working with. Um, within the tool and also use the insights we have from user experience um, and how to get how to get humans to do stuff most efficiently, um, how to get humans excited, actually even how to, the whole idea of gamification, how to get humans to um, really stick to um, doing something and put this all into one tool and that's, um, that's Prodigy. And so here we see some, um, some examples of those tasks and how to, you know, how we can present things in a more binary way. So in the top left, we have um, a named entity task. So here, this is this comes from Reddit, and, the, and we're labeling whether something is a product or not. And um, what we did here is we load in a spacey model, ask the model um, to label the products, and then we look at them and say yes or no. We could even, or we can also use a mode where we can, uh, where we can then actually click on this, remove this label something else um, but still you see okay we don't have to we don't have to do this in an excel spreadsheet we actually get one question we look at this and pretty much immediately um, uh, we we can say yes or no um, the same here on the right they were using I think this is actually a real example using um, the YOLO 2 uh, model with the default categories um, and we have um, an image of a skateboard we could say is this a skateboard yes or no um, and yeah immediately um, have our annotations here, and even this this one in the corner. Even if we if we're not able to really break it down into a true binary task, we can still make it um, more efficient and um, easier for a human to answer. Because here with keyboard shortcuts, you, you you can still do maybe two three seconds per annotation, and you have an answer. Or we say, hey, it's actually so fast. If we can get to one second, um, we might as well label our, our entire corpus twice. Um, positive, negative, other labels we want to do, uh, and just move move through it quicker. And yeah, to give you some background um, on like wh why did we do this? What do we um, what do we think Prodigy should achieve? 
Um, we really think that, okay, we, we want to be able to make annotation so efficient that data scientists can do it themselves. Or here, what we call data scientists can also be researchers, um, people working with the data, people training um, the models. Like it's, it's still, yeah, reading it like that, it's, it still doesn't sound like fun, but the idea is, you know, we could really make it um, a process that's efficient, that you actually really want to do this because you don't have to depend on anyone else. Um, you can just get the job, do job done and see whether your idea works or not. And the same, um, yeah, and this also means you can iterate faster. We're very used to, okay, you iterate on your code, but you can actually iterate on your code and your data. You try something out, doesn't work, try something else. Um, maybe see, okay, is it gonna work if I collect more annotations? You can all try this out. And we also wanna um, yeah, waste as little time as possible and use what the model already knows um, and have the human correct its predictions instead of just having a human do everything from scratch. And yeah, as a library itself, we really want um, Prodigy to fit into the Python ecosystem. We want it to be um, customizable, extensible in Python. You can write scripts for it. And we also, um, it was a very conscious decision not to make it a SaaS tool because we think data privacy is important. You don't, you, you shouldn't have to send your text to our servers for no reason. And we also think you should, you shouldn't be locked in. Like you should get a JSON format out that you can use to train your models however you like and not our random format um, that you can then download from our servers. So that's where we're going with Prodigy and just here's this very simple um, illustration of how the app looks. The center are recipes, which are very simple, Python scripts that orchestrate the whole thing. You have a REST API that communicates with the web app naturally, so you can you know, see things on the screen. Um, you have your data that's coming in, which is text images, um, and you can have an optional model state that's updated in a loop if, if you want that. And then you, you have the, the, mod, the model then communicates with the, reci um, with the recipe. Um, you can, um, as the user annotates, um, it's updated in a loop and can suggest um, uh, more annotations that are more compatible with the annotator's recent decisions. And yeah, we also, there's a database and a command line interface so you can actually use it efficiently and don't have to worry about these aspects. So here, can you see, yeah. Um, in the corner, we have a simple example of a recipe function, which really is just a Python function. You load your data in, and then you return this dictionary of components. For example, an ID of the data set, how to store your data, a stream of examples. You can pass in callbacks to update your model, um, things to execute before the thing starts. Um, so the idea is really, okay, if you can, if you need to load something in, if you can write that in Python, you can do it in Prodigy. Um, and you can also, we, we provide a bunch of um, pre, um, yeah, built-in recipes for different tasks with some ideas of how we think it could, you know, it, it could work like named entity recognition, for example. You can use the model, correct its predictions. You can use the model, say yes or no um, to things. You can um, use it for dependency parsing and look at an arc. Um, and annotate that. We have um, uh, recipes that use word vectors to build terminology lists, text classification. So there's a lot, also a lot that you can mix and match creatively. Like for example, you have those, the multiple choice um, example that's not really tied to any machine learning task, um, but it fits pretty much into any of these workflows that you might be doing. And of course the evaluation is also something we think is very, very important and is often neglected um, especially in yeah more industry use cases, um, but we think there's actually ABL evaluation is actually a very powerful um, way of um, testing whether you know your output is really what you want it to be. And um, yeah, and so here we see we see an example of okay the of how you can chain different workflows together all using models, word vectors, things you already have in order to get where you want to. Um, get too faster. So here, a simple example, we want we, we want to label fruit. Um, it's kind of a stupid example because it's like you, I can't think of many <laughs> use cases where you actually want to do that, but um, it, it, it makes a great um, yeah, illustration here. So um, yeah, we start off, we say, okay, we want fruit. What are fruit? We have some examples, apple, pear, banana. That's what we can think of. And we also have word vectors that we can use um, that will easily give us more um, terms that are similar to 
these three fruit that we, um, terms that we can, came up with. And then we can use this terminology list that we collected by just saying yes or no to what we've gotten out of the word vectors, um, look at those in our data, and then um, say whether apple, apples in this context is a fruit or not. Um, because we're still, you know, we're not just, um, yeah, labeling all fruit uh, terms as a fruit entity because, you know, it could be Apple, the company, but we get to look at it and it's much more efficient than if you ask the human to sit through and highlight every instance um, of fruit nouns in your text. And so this, this also leads to kind of our, one of our main um, uh, yeah, main aspects of the tool or workflows that we're especially proud of and that we think really can make a difference, which is, you know, we can actually start um, by telling the computer ab more abstract rules of what we're looking for and then annotating the exceptions instead of, yeah, really starting from scratch. Or we can use, we can even use the technology we're working with to build these semi-automatically using word vectors, using other, other cool things that we can now do. And then, of course, also um, specifically look at those examples that the model is, the statistical model we want to train is most uncertain about. So um, we try to avoid the predictions where we can be pretty sure that they're correct and actually really um, ask the user, ask the human first about the stuff that's 50-50 um, and um, where really the human feedback makes most of a difference. And so here's a quick example. Let's say, okay, we want to label um, uh, locations. We start off with one city, San Francisco, and then we look at what else is similar to that term. So these are actually these are actually real suggestions from that SenseDirect model that um, Matt showed earlier. And as you can see, we also we all, in the, the nice thing here is we in, we're using word vectors. We're not using a dictionary, so we're not gonna we're gonna annotate California and maybe University of San Francisco, but we're not gonna annotate California roles because we already you know we're in a vector space and we know that what we're actually looking for is at least similar to the real meaning. Of the word, and a lot of these are super trivial um, to answer, so we can accept them, we can reject them, or we can ignore them because we, because this is a bit too ambiguous, and we don't actually want that in our list because it can mean too many things. And then from here, we can actually create a pattern that uses um, spaces um, attributes, or in, in this case, um, yeah, the lo the token, the lower case form of the token, and GPE. That's stands for geopolitical entity, so anything with the government. And that's what we're trying to label, so we can easily build up these roles um, very quickly, very auto like automated, and then we have a bunch of locations that we can then match in our text. So here, um, it found a mention of Virginia, which we can then accept. So that's, that's a very, very simple example of this, but of course this also works for slightly more complex uh, constructs where we can re we can really take um, advantage of the um, syntactic structure. So here, this was an, this was a finance example. So what we're trying to do is we want to extract information about um, executive com compensation. So um, yeah, some executive receives some amount of money in stock, for example, like this one. And it's, it's this is a pretty difficult task, but also. The idea here is we have we have this theory that maybe if we could train a model, a text classification model, to predict whether a sentence is about ex executive compensation or not, we can then very, very easily use um, what we already know about the text to extract, let's say, the first person entity. We extract the amount of money, put that in our database, and um, we've actually, yeah, we found a good solution for an otherwise very, very complex task. So for this, this is just an idea. I haven't, like, we, you know, we haven't tried this in detail, but one possible pattern using um, token attributes we have available would be let's let's try look for an entity type person uh, followed by the lemma or um, a t token with a lemma receive so received receives receiving and followed by an ent by a token with the entity type money and let's just look at what this pulls up that's an idea I mean they're, they're, you can there are plenty of other um, possible patterns you can come up with and the nice thing is we're actually going to be looking at them again in context. So they don't have to be perfect. And even actually, in fact, even if it pulls up random stuff that you realize is totally not what you want, um, it's, this is also very important because you, you won't only be collecting um, annotations for the things you know are definitely right. You're also collecting 
um, annotations for the things that are very, very similar or look very, very similar to what you're looking for, but are actually not what you're looking for. And that's, that's probably just as important as um, the positive examples. So, yeah, the moral of the story is what we really, what we're saying is, you know, you, we're very used to iterating on our code as programmers, but, but you should, you should really be doing both. Like, the, the data is just as important. So we, as we see here, okay, that's the normal type of programming. You have a runtime program. You work on the source code. You compile it, get your runtime program. You don't like something about your program. You go back, change the source code, compile it, and so on. That's a pretty standard workflow. And in machine learning, we don't have a runtime program in that sense. We have a runtime model. So the part we should really be thinking about and working on is the training data. Instead, most focus is currently on the training algorithm. And that's, if you use that analogy, that's kind of, that's very similar to um, going and tweaking your compiler if you're not happy with your runtime program. You can do that, but of course, um, you probably go back and edit your source code. And um, I think this is actually, this is actually a pretty good example and it's pretty accurate. And um, you usually, you know, there are only so many training algorithms, but what really makes a difference is your data. So if you have a good way and a fast way of iterating on that data, um, you'll actually, and you know, you're able to really master this part of the problem. You, you'll also get to try more things quickly. You really, you know, as we know, most ideas don't actually work. I think that's, it's always one of these things that's uh, kind of misrepresented or a lot of people have this idea, ooh, you're doing all these amazing AI things and everything just works. And it's like, kind of doesn't, like nothing works. Um, and sometimes, sometimes things work and you, you know, you really, you want to find the things that actually work and, you know, for that you need to try them. And so, um, it also means, you know, if you can actually figure out what works, before you try it and invest in it, it, you know, you can actually be more successful of all because you don't, you're not going to waste um, your time on um, the things that might fail and or scale things up that actually, um, yeah, weren't even supposed to work in the first place. And one thing that's also very important to us is you can really build custom solutions. You can, um, you know, build solutions that fit exactly to your use case and, um, you know, you'll keep these, and if you collect your own data, you'll keep that forever and nobody can lock you in. You're not just consuming some API, and if that API shuts down, you can start again from scratch. You are actually, you know, you have your data, no matter what other cool things we can do at some point in the future, you can always go back to your labeled data um, and really, um, yeah, build your own, build your own systems. And we believe that this is really something that's very important in the future of the technology. That's also a reason why we think AI development in general in companies should be done in-house. Um, and yeah, we're hoping that we can yeah, keep providing useful tools um, that will make this easier. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the question is, um, yeah. Jeremy thinks we write very good software, <laughs> even though we're only two people and how we're doing that. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, we do get this um, a lot. I mean, I think it's, um, I, I don't even know where this idea comes from that like, uh, uh, yeah, you can scale things up. Like, I don't know, scaling things up um, makes things better because I, I do think, um, yeah, actually, the more people you get involved, you sometimes, it actually can have a very negative um, impact on the quality of, the software you produce. In our case, it's just, okay, it just works. Like I'm also, I also don't like this idea of, oh, everyone can do exactly the same thing if they just work hard, even though people like thinking of it that way. It's just, okay, in our case, we have a good combination of like things that we like to do, things that we, we, we happen to be good at, and it just works together. So I guess we, we are lucky in, in that way, but we also cut out a lot of bullshit, like the amount of like meetings we don't take, the amount of, <laughs> Events we don't go to. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of ironic saying that at, speaking at an event, but like, <laughs> I really don't normally go to um, many events. I don't, uh, we don't take coffee dates with random people we barely know. We don't, um, yeah, we mostly, we really just like to write software. And yeah, we've had some good ideas in the past. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Have you done any, any experiments to see if it actually biases annotators? 
show them the right, to show them your model's examples versus just having them use them as prep? Like, do you, don't, do you look at any of the trade offs uh, associated with that? I mean, we've uh, also, um, to, um, uh, the question is um, how, if we've done any um, experiments um, where we compare the binary decisions. Um, and whether um, it influences the annotators versus really doing everything from scratch. So we haven't done experiments specifically focusing on the bias because that's in, in some sense that's, very, that's difficult because you know we're mostly looking we're looking at the output we're looking at um, does it improve accuracy. We've done experiments of um, manual annotation versus um, binary annotation, but also mostly focused on our own tooling because I we think. It's kind of useless, like, yeah, we can present you a study where we said, oh, we did stuff in an Excel spreadsheet, and then we did stuff in Prodigy, and it was much better. So it's really, it's mostly focused around you know, our own tooling, and we did um, find that, well, it, it, depends on, it depends on the task you're doing. That's the other thing. It's sometimes, I feel like giving these answers is, it sounds unsatisfying, because I'm always saying, well, it depends on your data. But that's also kind of, that, that's also the whole point of it, because, you know, we're doing this because your data is different, and there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, but essentially, so we found what um, binary annotation works especially well if you already have a pre-trained model that um, predicts something, ideally also something that's not completely terrible. Um, otherwise, the pattern approach does work very well on uh, kind of um, limited, very specific domains. Like we did one example of um, where we labeled uh, drug names on Reddit, like on our opiates, which was a pretty good it was a, this was a pretty good data source because it's a very specific topic, and also it's a subreddit that's very on topic because people, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's how, you know, people who discuss who go on Reddit to discuss opiate use, um, you know, usually you know, are very dedicated to talking about this one topic. So it, it was a good, interesting data source. And um, so what we wanted to do is we labeled drug names, so um, drugs and pharmaceuticals. And in order to, for example, have a better have a better tool set to analyze, really analyze the content of the subreddit um, and see how it develops over time. Anyway, um, so there we found the pattern-based approach worked very, very well because we have very specific terms. We can use word vectors to bootstrap um, these, especially also we can include spelling mistakes and stuff, which was very interesting. Like we can really build up good word lists, find them in a text, uh, confirm them, and get to pretty decent accuracy. I would expect this work to work a little less well, the cold start problem, on a much more ambiguous domain. And there, you're probably better off to say, OK, we're labeling by hand. But even there, that's something I haven't really shown in detail here. But we've also, we have a manual interface where you highlight. But what we do there is we use the tokenizer to pre-segment the text. So you don't have to sit there and pixel perfect, like highlight, and then, ah, shit, now I got the white space in. Ugh, let's start again. So that's that's another thing we're doing. You can, um, yeah, you can be much lazier in highlighting, and also they get more efficiency out of it, um, and still use a simpler interface. Yeah. So you mentioned about the uh, many tools that sometimes that. Yeah. Um, so okay, so the question is, um, well, um, it, this, um, it first started. You gave an example of um, annotating patient um, data, which is obviously yeah very problematic because doctors are not always very specific in what they fill in. And then in the end, um, this was how did they enri they enrich that with? Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, okay, the question is whether we have some experience with, um, um, yeah, in the medical field mixing this. Not like, uh, the answer is, well, we haven't personally done this. We do have um, quite a few companies in um, that domain, also because, um, yeah, um, the tool itself is quite appealing because you can run it in your own um, compliant environment, um, you know, it's based, that data privacy aspect. Um, but it's definitely, it's interesting, be interesting to explore. That's maybe also where, okay, having the professionals, getting the medical professionals more involved might make sense, which normally is very difficult. You don't want the doctor to do all the work themselves, but if you can find some way to distill that and then ask the doctor, okay, you said you wrote this here. Does that mean 
you vote X, does that mean Y? And the doctor says, yep, or the doctor says, nah. That if you can try this out and, you know, extract some information about that, that could be one idea to solve that. For example, yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, you can, like right now, it's not. We don't have a built-in, um, um, yeah, logic for that. Although we are working on. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to repeat the question. Um, uh, uh, Inter-annotator agreement. Um, if you can calculate that and incorporate that into your model. So we're actually working on an extension for Prodigy, which is much more specifically for managing multiple annotators, because we really the the tool here we really designed specifically as a developer tool first, and then um, you know scaling it up a second. But since you have the binary feedback, and if you have an idea, if you have an algorithm you want to use, and you kind of you, you know you know what you want, you can already do that fairly easily because you can download all the data as JSON. You have a key that's answer, which is either accept, reject, or ignore. Um, you can attach your own arbitrary data like a user ID, and then it's fairly trivial to yeah write your own function that really takes all of this, reads it in, computes something, and then um, uses this later on. So that's definitely possible. But we also this is also something we we're very really interested in, um, yeah, exploring and working on. And binary interface is great for trying to integrate, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah. So basically, bi binary. Yeah, that's also that's a big advantage of the binary interface is that, um, yeah, they only pretty much yeah the two options. You filter out the ignored ones, and then yeah, you you can really answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can, like, you could design. Uh, so the um, question was, or, or, um, the inter one interface I showed, which was the sentiment one with the multiple selections. This is not binary. That's true. And actually, it's also something we usually tell our users: avoid this as much as possible if you can. Like that's, um, and some in some cases you might still want that. Or we say, look, if you need to, if you. You know, a lot of people still think of surveys when they think of annotating data. And we, I get where this is coming from, but I think if you can leave that sort of mindset and really open up a bit and think of other creative ways, you can get more out of this. If you want to re-engineer a survey, maybe you want to use a survey tool. But, um, but so this, I would, so for example, if I were doing this with those four options, I would say, okay, we have all texts. The annotator sees every text four times and says, is this happy or is this not happy? And because you can get to one second per annotation, that's very fast. Like you can, even if you have thousands of examples, you can do this in a day yourself. And so that's how we would probably solve this. And it also means you get every example four times. And for each text, you know, is it sad? Is it happy? Is it neutral? Is it something else? You have much more data, but not everyone wants this. Like some people really want to, really want to build that survey and we let them, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question is, yeah, if you're doing the same example multiple times, whether um, it slows down the annotation or not. Well, actually, I mean, it's difficult to say because it depends. Huh? But um, I've actually found that even if you do the bare maths, um, it can easily be much faster because if you, you know, you say, okay, 1,000 examples, um, and normally if you really have to think about five different concepts that are maybe not even fully related. That just every tiny bit of friction you put between a human and the interface or the decision can very significantly slow down the process. So you think about, oh, is this happy or is this sad or is this about sports or is this about horses? And just this thing that can easily add like 10 seconds to each question. So if you do, if you do the whole thing three times um, at one second, you're still faster than you would have been if you'd added this friction. And also, and the, and the other part is the, just the human error. Human, if you if you have to think too much, you're much more likely to fuck it up and do it badly. And then that's also something you know. That's also something you want to you want to avoid. You know that the yeah. active learning helps a lot here as well. So if you have like 90 labels, it's very confident that these 90 labels don't apply, and so you just don't have to learn something. So yeah, yeah. To like, yeah. Repeat this. Act, the active learning also makes um, a difference here because you can actually, um, yeah, you could you could pre-select the ones that really make a difference to annotate and don't have to like really go through every single one that um, yeah it's not as important as some of the other ones that you really care about. Yeah. Um, have you, you guys have experienced that with 
experience working with tasks like that and how do you sort of set um, yeah, so the, the question is, um, yeah, what about tasks that need a lot of context, like the whole medical history or just a whole document? Um, so we basically, so we have, oh, and whether we have experience with that. So in general, we do say if you can't, if your task requires so much context that you can't fit this into the Prodigy interface, then it doesn't mean that you can't train a model on that. But for most of the tasks that users most commonly want to do, this is often also an indicator that it's very, very difficult to actually teach your model that, like if you're doing named entity recognition or um, even text classification and you need um, a lot of context and every other context is equally as important, that's often an indicator that that might not work so well. So for example, text classification, we say, okay, we start off by selecting one sentence from the whole document and then um, instead of you re annotating the whole document, you say, okay, this is the most important sentence. Um, is, does this label apply or not? So there are some tricks um, we use uh, to get around um, th this problem because, um, yeah, we also think that, okay, it's, it's important to, um, yeah, to get this across and frame it in that way because, um, yeah, if you need two pages on your screen, it's not, it's, not if, it's not efficient at all and also likely you can do all that work but your model won't learn that because your model needs um, local context as well, at least for the tasks that we are presenting. I don't know if you had anything. To add no, to that, yeah, okay. Right. But, you know, often it's important to take into account that the models really are invariant and moving and they're going to give you the fact that you need multiple tools. Um, yeah, so the suggestion was, yeah, okay, having some tool, some process um, that goes along with the software <laughs> that helps people break this down. And um, yeah, we've actually been thinking about this a lot because we do realize, you know, the tool is quite new. And we're introducing a lot of new concepts at once, and also some best practices where we think, ah, that's how you should do it, or you could try this. And we are also realizing that there's no real satisfying one-size-fits-all answer. That's another problem. Everyone's use case is different, so right now what we're doing is we have a support form for Prodigy where we answer people's questions, and actually a lot of users share what they're working on, asking for tips, um, we kind of talk about it, other users come in and are like, oh, I actually try to do this type of medical, or this type of legal annotation, and here's what worked for me, and have this sort of exchange around you to figure out, okay, what works, because, yeah, it's just like, I think, in machine learning, deep learning, a lot of the best practices are still, like, evolving, um, and it's very, um, yeah, it's very, very specific, so it's definitely, yeah, we're open for suggestion there as well, but, like, we're we're still in the process of, yeah, really coming up with a good set of best practices and ideas. Um, the question is whether we, yeah, we have any plans to sell model, models like medical models. Yes, as part of what, what Matt mentioned in the very introduction, we are definitely we're definitely planning on having more of a models. So like an online store for very very specific models. So medical. That's, that's a very, very interesting domain. And if so, we really want to be, have it specific, like medical texts in uh, French or Chinese, and really go in that direction. Because we believe that, OK, pre-trained models are very valuable. And even if you do medical texts, if you can start off with a pre-trained model, then you can use a tool like Prodigy or something else to really fine tune it on your very, very specific context, have word vectors in it that already fit to your domain, maybe update those as well. We think that this is yeah, a very future-proof way of working with these technologies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So currently, uh, so question is uh, the text classification model we're using in Prodigy, if more infos, more details on that. So what we're using is Spacey's um, text classification model. That's by, by, um, what's built in. But I think actually this question is pretty good because what's important to note is that Prodigy itself has comes with a few built-in recipes that are basically ideas for, okay, how you could train a text classifier. You could use Spacey, but it's definitely not tied to those. Like the idea, the tool itself is really the scaffolding around it. So if you say, hey, I wrote my own model using PyTorch and I would like to train this, all you need to do is you ha need to have one function that takes examples and updates your model, and you need to have one function that takes raw text and outputs a score for each text. And then you feed, you uh, provide that to Prodigy. And then um, you can use the same active learning mechanism as you would use um, with a built-in model. So the idea is really it's the models we ship are just 
um, a suggestion or an idea you can use to try it out. But ultimately, we also hope that people in the future will transition to just plugging in their own model um, and just you know using the scaffolding around it um, to do that. But we definitely don't want to lock anyone in and say, oh, you have to use Spacey, like especially for NER and stuff and other things. We think Spacey is pretty good. But if you don't want to do that or for other use cases, especially text classification, we think there are a lot of cases where you might want to use scikit-learn or Falco Wabbit, yeah, um, or <laughs> what a great name. Um, yeah, or basically something completely custom. Yeah. Um, so the question is uh, the active learning part, whether this is built on the underlying model. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, so the question is um, a, um, active learning versus no active learning, how well this works. First, also to, to maybe as a general introduction, so what we're doing for most of the examples is we use a basic um, uncertainty sampling. That's what we found works best. But we also know there are lots of other ways you could be solving that. So, um, you know, in the end, what, how we implement this is we have a simple function that takes a stream and outputs um, a sorted stream based on the, the assigned scores and um, the model in the loop. So how you wire this up, again, is also up to you. And um, yeah, to answer the part about yeah what works best, in general, in our kind of framework where you really, you see one sentence at a time and often, you know, you start off with a model not knowing very much. The active learning component of basically resorting the stream is actually very crucial because otherwise, if you start from scratch, have very few examples, you'll be annotating for a very, very long time and, um, all kinds of have all kinds of random uh, predictions. You annotate your your stream in order. There's very little. You need some kind of guidance that tells you, okay, what to work on next. Especially if you feed in millions of texts, you need to sort them. You need to pre-select them based on something. And this could be the model's predictions. This could be something else. This could be the keywords or the patterns. But without that, um, yeah, it's it's very very difficult. And that's also yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to solve with the tool. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ines and uh, Matthew. Um, I, I got to say, um, you know, uh, anybody who's using fast AI has any time you've used fast AI NLP or fast AI uh, text, you've called the Spacey tokenize function. Uh, you're using uh, Spacey behind the scenes, and the reason you're using Spacey is because I tried every damn tokenizer I could find, um, and Spacey's was like so much better than everything else. And then the kind of story of fast AI's development is that over time I get sick of all the shitty parts of every third party library I find and I gradually rewrite them myself. And the fact that I haven't rewritten Spacey or attempted to is because I, I actually think it's one of those rare pieces of software that doesn't suck at all, is actually really good. Um, uh, it's got good documentation, and it's got a good install story, and, uh, and so forth. And I haven't um, used Prodigy, but just the fact that these guys are working on, uh, I recognize the importance of active learning and the importance of combining human plus machine, puts them in that rare category of people who, in my opinion, are actually working on what's one of the most important problems today. So um, uh, thank you both so much for coming and for this um, fantastic talk and I look forward to seeing uh, what you do next. Thank you.